I want to note, first of all, that we we're going to have two attorneys who represent Guantanamo prisoners here. I believe that they're both in the prison this weekend um, visiting their clients, and <clears throat> that is a very good thing. We miss them, but that exactly is where they should be. Um, this was um, Ramsey Kassem and Candace Gorman, who both represent a number of prisoners there. Um, and we were going to have a really large panel, but now we're just going to fill it up with our big minds. <laughs> um, I want to introduce, first of all, Jeremy Verone uh, from Witness Against Torture. Jeremy's on the faculty at the New School, too, and he edits a journal about the 60s and is um, not only knows about activism and culture, but is an activist and is very cultured at the same time. <laughs> And Golnaz and I have uh, corresponded on email for a while, and we're finally getting to meet each other. She's with a very um, significant legal effort called the International Justice Network that is focused on several things, but primarily, or importantly, on the prisoners at Bagram that um, have been, up until this very moment, by the Obama administration, denied their petitions for habeas corpus. Why? Because the US has imprisoned people in a war zone. How did the war zone get to be there in Afghanistan? Well, I think the US had something to do with that. But whatever, they will not give these 6,000 prisoners habeas corpus rights, so therefore, they don't have to be charged, they don't have to know why they're there, they don't have to be represented legally, and they don't have to have any way out. It's a continuing outrage. And we're very fortunate to have Phil Nas here to walk us through that. And then we'll, you know, kick it open for questions. Um, so I think Jeremy will present first on Guantanamo and the efforts um, that we, many of us, are making to close it. And then Phil Nas will talk about um, background. Okay, great. So hi, everybody. Um, thanks to Deb and Stephanie for organizing this, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, as Deb indicated, I live something of a double life. I'm a professor in civilian life, and then my other great life commitment is as a participant in the struggle to close Guantanamo with an organization called Witness Against Torture. I'll narrate very briefly my journey. It started for me in 2005. I watched the news, read the newspapers about Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, and found myself apoplectic, irate, despondent. It seemed like this couldn't be. Um, I wanted to do something. It occurred to me that somebody ought to do something. It dawned on me that I could be part of that, um, you know, someone, but I didn't know what to do. And then in December of 2005, I got an email saying that 25 um, Americans had gone to Guantanamo physically in Cuba to hold a protest at the camp and bear witness at a distance to the moral evil that the prison and that seemed to me an epic, you know, fantastic assertion of political will and moral courage. I wanted to know who these people were, work with them. A lot of them were in New York City. When they came back from Cuba, they started witness against torture in the United States to pressure the government to close the prison, and I've been involved with that group um, ever since. So I consider myself a sort of um, reluctant veteran of a campaign that should have ended years ago. And then me and Deb and other sort of veterans of the struggle marvel that we're still at this. But we've all made this solemn determination that we will you know, be involved with this sort of as long as it takes, if that's you know, our own natural lifetimes. And then hopefully there'll be you know, a legacy beyond our lifetimes if that's what's um, uh, you know, necessary here. Um, Witness Against Torture and other groups has used everything in the democratic toolbox to try to shut down Guantanamo petitions, marches, rallies, editorials, lobbying, um, demonstrations, vigils, um, and also, importantly, nonviolent direct action to try to achieve um, our goal. Like I, like others in the group, are volunteers. I have no special rank or position um, with respect to this issue. And I've often wondered why is it up to me and a handful of my friends to sort of care about this? Like, hasn't government horribly abdicated its responsibility if, you know, sort of citizens at the grassroots are taking up the banner of this cause? And every time I ask myself, why me, the answer comes in the form of another question, which is, 
um, if not us, then who? Okay, you know, why not me? Um, and you know, for any social movement to succeed, a lot of people need to make a deep commitment of the head and the heart to righting some kind of moral wrong. And the exciting thing with this issue is that more and more every day people are being called to conscience and committing the head and the heart to doing something about this, um, you know, terrible, um, terrible evil. And then discussions of Guantanamo are often structurally depressing. This one, in many respects, um, will be that way also. But I think now it's tinged with a new kind of hope because, again, there's this surge of grassroots um, activism and concern with the fate of the prisoners and real prospects for real progress on this issue that I'll talk about um, towards the end. Now, over the years, I've given lots of you know, similar talks, and then I'll use kind of the core structure of those talks as a kind of template, but make certain refinements that um, speak to the special context we're in. Um, one static feature of all of my public speaking about this is to denounce Guantanamo as a moral, legal, political, and spiritual abomination and to insist that it must close. And then I won't you know, say much along those lines because I assume we're all in agreement. I'll just sort of take that as a sort of moral fact or you know, consensus imperative that this is terrible um, and that it must end. I would like to speak a little bit to the urgency of you know, the task today. For years, people who followed the issue predicted that if President Obama continued uh, you know, not to act on his promise to close the prison, things would go from bad to worse and beyond. And then things got to worse, I think, when Adnan Latif um, likely killed himself a little over a year ago. He was a man from Yemen whose repatriation was forbidden due to a ban on transfers of um, Yemeni folks. And then he also was the leading plaintiff in a case that the Supreme Court could have heard, saying that a lot of folks at Guantanamo had won their habeas petitions, they'd been ordered free by federal judges, but there was no mechanism to actually execute the will and the decision of judges, and doesn't that render the habeas right sort of problematic? So this was the last like big legal mechanism lawyers and others were searching for to sort of force the hand of the Obama administration to push out of the prison those folks who had won their habeas cases and were deemed sort of no threat to the United States. The Supreme Court um, decided not to hear his case and then somewhat predictably Latif, you know, descended into an even deeper despair and, you know, so we assume um, took his life. Uh, it's completely crestfallen and heartbroken, staring at a lifetime of um, indefinite detention away from the folks <coughs> he loved. And then if that was worse, we've gone beyond worse with a hunger strike. And then yes, it's given us a sense of hope. It's you know, mobilized people around the country and around the world. It's forced the hand of President Obama to re-announce his promise to close Guantanamo. But it's born of an extraordinary degree of you know, despair. And then the men there you know, are trying to free themselves or they will die trying. And then you know, our task is to make sure that they work to free themselves and then they not die trying. But that some of them will die trying is um, a possibility, maybe even you know, a probability. And all of us are sort of waiting for the day that we hear that somebody on hunger strike has expired due to severe malnutrition, the breakdown of basic physiological functions, um, and so forth. So you know, if, since its existence, Guantanamo needed to be shut down sort of now more than ever. We need public pressure and public action to achieve that goal. Um, another feature of my talks has been, in recent years, to discuss why Guantanamo hasn't closed, despite the day one executive order of Obama. <clears throat> and there's no definitive answer to this question, but a lot of plausible suggestions that you know, journalists and historians and other analysts have made. And then I want to you know, course through some what some of those are. I mean, one is to say that Obama politically mismanaged good intentions. That gives him a certain amount. A second says that he sold out the issue because people his administration uh, convinced him that the political cost was too high. And there's very good evidence indicating that Rahm Emanuel, David Axelrod, thought that he would put in jeopardy bipartisan support for his domestic agenda of financial reform and health care if he pushed too hard in Guantanamo. He'd antagonize the Republicans, create an unworkable political situation. He would accomplish nothing domestically. And that's probably the most convincing local reason as to why he backed out uh, of Guantanamo essentially making these guys you know, collateral damage in political machination. And then these folks were sold out for a terrible bargain, because how many votes did Obama get in the Republican side for health care? You know, exactly zero. So it was sort of like a, you know, a sort of terrible, terrible um, deal. In addition, I think Obama's proven himself to be much more of a security hawk than folks had 
initially believed. We've seen again the power of fear and demagoguery to sort of trump, you know, reason um, and morality. We've seen that executive authority, when given power, very rarely voluntarily um, relinquishes it. We've seen a gross failure of conviction and leadership from uh, our president. We've seen the tenacity of a politics of vengeance stemming from the unworked through trauma of 9-11. And I think America's sort of still freaked out, not knowing how to you know, respond to that sort of horrible day when it became victim and is lashed out in sort of violence and uh, anger as a result of that trauma. Now, whatever the reason for presidential inaction, the reality is absolutely abominable. And America continues to you know, seal its fate as a torture nation every day that Obama, um, that Guantanamo um, uh, remains open. And then I'd like to you know, add to those explanations where Guantanamo hasn't closed by taking somewhat of a larger view. You know, our calculation when he came into office, witness against torture, other folks in the United Guantanamo community, was that a more moral, intelligent, and conscientious president running on a message of hope and change and the repudiation of the worst excesses of his predecessor could conduct American foreign policy in a less immoral way and at least minimize the damage to others in our own ideas. Okay, so like a better man could do American power in a less <laughs> immoral and kind of you know nauseating way. And then some could argue that by some small measure, Obama has done you know some of that, been a little bit less aggressive and hawkish in the conduct of you know empire. But the big story I think is one of continuity between Bush and Obama. And then just yesterday in Politico, Ari Fleischer, the pinhead press spokesman for Bush, was quoted as saying, drone strikes, wiretaps, Gitmo renditions, military commissions, Obama's carrying out Bush's fourth term. Okay? Lindsey Graham, you keep doing what you're doing. Obama, President Bush started it, President Obama's continuing it. We need it from my point of view. Okay, so this is from you know the other side, the Republicans, um, a statement of the profound structural continuities between um, you know, the conduct of the Bush and the Obama administrations. And, you know, it, at some level now, our, our sort of master conclusion is that all of these things, Gitmo, renditions, you know, Bagram, drone strikes, are something close to the structural requirements of empire. If you need oil, resources, labor, and markets, if you, then you need an obscenely large and lethal military, you need drones, you need prisons, and you need dirty war especially if you're fighting against a dirty enemy like Al-Qaeda. And then therein lies the peculiar quality of this struggle worth noting. Notwithstanding a sort of radical structural critique of American empire, we're fighting for bedrock and even corny principles like innocent until proven guilty and equality under the law. Okay? Even though we're fighting for very basic and you know, corny things, they're so difficult to achieve or be granted because they challenge the conduct of empire. And then lastly, our own analysis indicates that the fight to close Guantanamo is just really the tip of the iceberg and must be integrated into a much larger struggle against empire. And yet we have to remain steadfastly, almost monomaniacally dedicated to this comparatively small goal to um, actually achieve it. So that's the second part of my you know, brief talk, which is a riff on you know, how and why it's been so hard to close. There's an element of political machination, and there's also what I call the sort of structural necessities of empire. The small goal is closing Guantanamo. The big goal is challenging the fundamentals of uh, American power rooted ultimately in capitalist political economy. Um, now, the last dimension of my talks, typically in my one today, is to, you know, rally a sense of hope. And I always say, you know, we can't abandon hope. Why? First and foremost, because doing so would mean abandoning the detainees and leaving them, for sure, to a miserable fate of being indefinitely detained. And this is first and foremost about the 166 men who are suffering there, and then somewhat secondarily about constitutional and legal and sort of moral principles that are dear to um, Americans. So we can't abandon hope because we can't abandon them. You might also reason that no evil this radical can persist forever. Slavery was undone. It took decades to do it. Perhaps the arc of history does bend towards justice. One day America might apologize for this and might offer restitution to the victims and 
their families like they did with those interned of Japanese American descent during World War II. Even if we can't imagine what the mechanism for that future consensus looks like, we can you know, sort of assume it might be there. Um, but this is a rather abstract and cosmic way of understanding hope, rooted in a sense of moral necessity, not so much political reality. It has been that I've articulated a kind of hope against hope in spite of enormous optimism. But now, for the first time in years, I think <laughs> there's grounds for a much more rational hope, grounded in you know political dynamics. And then I'll speak you know very briefly um, to that to conclude. Like as Deb said, we were in a terrible position, you know, a year ago. You know, maybe 60 people gathered for the annual pilgrimage to Washington on January 11th, the anniversary of the day that Guantanamo opened. You know, the lawyers were saying, the human rights professionals were saying that there's no uh, really mechanism imaginable by which Guantanamo would close. And then shortly after that, me and Matt Dalwizio, another guy I witnessed, talked to journalists of some prominence, national security reporters. And we asked them, does anybody anywhere in the administration care about this at all? And the answer was no. One guy gave us, you know, a political analysis and concluded that these men were fucked by history. Like we know that. That's the premise here. It's unfortunate that we can't sort of let that, um, you know, be. And then we didn't took that, you know, educated cynicism as a reason to give up. And then the hunger strike happened, and an enormous amount, um, you know, has changed. And just to underscore some of what has changed, um, you know, the hunger strike was an exotic story in the shadows of American political life, and it moved and was pushed more and more to the center, yielding certain positive signs. I mean, one is that I think there's an emerging consensus that at question with the hunger strike is not the treatment of the prisoners at the prison or any illegal minutiae, but the existence of the Camp 2 Corps, okay? That we need to sort of relitigate the existence of Guantanamo and make a decision as a nation sort of for or against it. And right now, arguably, the preponderance of elite editorial opinion is saying again that we need to shut it down. Secondly, the nation seemingly overnight has been educated in important particulars, that 86 men are cleared for release, that there shouldn't be a blanket ban on the Yemenis, that there are provisions in the NDAA for Obama to you know, override Congress and release people. And then this used to be like Gitmo Exotica, known to a handful of diehards. And now these are commonly recited sort of talking points in the public articulation of the position that Obama should close. And then last, of course, President Obama restated his promise to close the Guant Guantanamo and has in some sense restarted the clock. So those are political developments. From the standpoint of our movement, very briefly, we've gotten bigger, we've gotten younger, we've gotten more diverse, more secular, dare I say, hipper, and at last interested in linking Guantanamo to issues of domestic incarceration, and particularly abuses of solitary confinement, draconian prison sentences, etc. So we're trying to link the mass incarceration movement here with you know, interest in you know, foreign detention in Obama and Bagram. And then last and most importantly, like people are flocking to the movement who don't seem so terribly jaded by you know, 10 years of the war on terror, who haven't in their minds rationalized this away. Every day, meaning a 19, 20, 21 year old, who says, this doesn't compute, this doesn't make sense on any level. This is immoral, it's illogical, it's illegal, it's un-American, we should do something about it, and it's gotta be so easy. There's only 166 of them, we know their names, we know their story, the president has said, let's close it, let's close it. And then, you know, I wanna say like, oh, not so nice. <laughs> like, I have no idea how hard this is. But like, I hold my tongue, because what's important is the purity of that conviction, like the purity of that passion, and the sense that this is possible, and with like will and an energy and initiative, you know, we can do it. And then this is what might be a kind of like enabling fiction, like a story of the possibility for victory that we need to tell ourselves to propel ourselves through all the difficult work that, um, you know, lies ahead that we're gonna win on this. Like the president has spoken, he has spoken before. We're in terra incognita here. Like nobody knows what it looks like to leverage, you know, those noble words and all this public pressure into a plan and a plan into policy that clears out those cleared for release and does something to permanently close Guantanamo. So at this point, the strategy is 
you know, all of the above, the more the merrier, you know, every bit of citizen action makes its own special contribution to, you know, progress on this decade-long, very small and, you know, hugely epic struggle on which, you know, so much depends the lives of the men there and the health of everyone. staff attorney with an organization called the International Justice Network. Um, it's a small organization based here in the U.S. which has been fighting since about 2006 um, <coughs> on behalf of the men <coughs> indefinitely by the U.S. military at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. I'm just going to take a quick informal poll. How many of you feel as if you already have some sense of what has been going on at Bagram? Show of hands. Okay. So I think I'm lucky to have a particularly well-informed room because yeah. um, by comparison to this show of hands, I think unfortunately um, Bagram is not really something that much of the American public knows anything about or the global public for that matter. And I think that there are a lot of reasons for why by comparison to Guantanamo, Bagram is less well-known, how to become part of the popular imagination. Um, and maybe, you know, those are, those are reasons that we could discuss during question and answer, why the difference. Um, but for purposes of my time with you today, I think what I'd like to do is begin by addressing some of the key respects in which the situation of the prisoners held by the US at uh, Bagram is very similar to the situation of prisoners held by the US at Guantanamo, address some of the very key ways in which their situation is very different from the situation of the prisoners held at Guantanamo. Um, then I'll sort of step back and give you just some contextual information, some background about how the US detention apparatus at Bagram has and hasn't changed over time since 2002. Um, and then I'd like to leave you with a sense of some of the very sort of concerning uncertainties that apply today uh, with respect to Bagram and how it fits in uh, how it fits into this sort of sense of hope or uh, this perception of hope, um, particularly uh, in connection with Guantanamo and the renewed rhetoric around Guantanamo. Um, so like the, the prisoners held by the US at Guantanamo, the men being held by the US at Bagram are being held there as part of the so-called war on terror. Um, they're being held pursuant to uh, the authorization for use of military force that Congress passed somewhat hastily in the wake of the events of September 11. Um, and they're being held uh, without charge and without trial. Um, like many of the prisoners at Guantanamo, the prisoners at Bagram, at least at some point during their confinement, particularly if we're thinking about the prisoners who've been held there over a very long-term period, since 2002, since 2003, many of those men uh, have been subjected to illegal treatment, to torture, uh, to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, and to otherwise coercive and abusive um, interrogation. Um, in terms of some of the, the key ways in which the situation of Bagram prisoners is different, from the situation of prisoners at Guantanamo. <laughs> Unlike prisoners at Guantanamo, no prisoner in US custody at Bagram has any right of access to an attorney. Um, and I think that that's extremely significant for at least two reasons. I think chief among those reasons is the way in which lack of access to counsel um, necessarily uh, affects or shapes the experience of confinement. So, However um, abominable, however abhorrent the circumstances, the conditions at Guantanamo are, I think it's still worth recognizing that at least since 2008, when uh, the Supreme Court recognized as a constitutional matter that prisoners held at Guantanamo have a right of access to United States courts, and in conjunction with that right of access have a right to an attorney. Um, because of that right, however sort of feeble and limited it is, those prisoners, at least on some infrequent basis, have the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with someone who is not affiliated with their jailer, and someone with whom ostensibly they've been able to, or we hope have been able to, establish a relationship of trust, right? 
So by comparison, men in US custody at Bagram have no such uh, right of access. They have no such uh, comparable uh, connection to the outside world. And so I think by comparison, perhaps their experience is even more isolating. And that's very troubling, I think, for obvious reasons. Um, another, I think, serious problem that arises out of this lack of access to counsel is sort of from our perspective as attorneys who are nonetheless trying to advocate on behalf of these men. Um, as you might imagine, not having direct access to them seriously impedes our ability to advocate for them. Um, so one way in which that I think holds true is the information that we have available to us about these men, it's pretty well limited um, to what we've been able to learn through their families or what's otherwise available on the public record. Um, or what's been selectively disclosed to us by their jailer. Um, so I think the one upshot to that dearth of information is that it's really forced, I think, particularly creative and collaborative advocacy among this small group of attorneys doing this work. Again, for obvious reasons. When your information is limited and your resources are limited, it's particularly incumbent upon you to collaborate with your allies and to draw connections within the limited body of information to which you do have access. Um, another sort of very key difference, legal difference, between the situation of the, the prisoners held at Bagram and those held at Guantanamo is this issue of right, a right of access to US courts to be able to challenge your imprisonment. Um, prisoners at Guantanamo, at least since 2008, have had a constitutional right of access to um, bring petitions of habeas corpus, petitions for writs of habeas corpus, uh, challenging their detention as unlawful. Um, now, you know, what's happened since 2008 in connection with that right, I think, uh, would be disappointing um, it's probably disappointing to most of us uh, when we see what's become of that right um, as a result of the litigation of these cases in the United States. It's ar arguable that the habeas right left to Guantanamo prisoners, there's barely anything to it anymore. It's really not a meaningful right. But still, by comparison, uh, prisoners at Bagram have absolutely no right of access to United States courts to challenge their detention, and that's true even if you're a Bagram prisoner who's been in US custody there since 2002, and that's true even if you're somebody whom the United States did not apprehend on the Afghan battlefield, but rather forcibly rendered to Afghanistan for the purpose of indefinite detention. Um, in terms of sort of giving you some background contextual information. Um, the United States has been operating uh, its detention facilities at Bagram Air Base, which is, I think, maybe 50 miles north of Kabul, um, since about 2002. And since that time, the prison population held by the United States has really ballooned. Um, I can tell you, for example, that in 2009, there were between six and 700 men in indefinite detention uh, at, at Bagram. By 2012, according to figures released by the International Committee of the Red Cross, that number had swelled to over 3,000 men in indefinite detention. Um, sort of beyond those lump sum numbers about the totality of the prison population, we really don't know very much uh, about the prison population. We do know some crude demographics. So for example, um, we know that there are at least 50 non-Afghan citizens in U.S. custody at Bagram. Um, of those approximately 50 prisoners, the majority come from Pakistan, and the remainder come from assorted Middle Eastern and other uh, countries. Presumably, the vast majority of prisoners who have been held by the U.S. have been Afghan citizens, but again, um, we don't really know more, more than this. Um, something else that we do know about the detention apparatus at Bagram is the process that the US military has used um, to uh, determine and to reassess the so-called status of these prisoners as alleged enemies of the United States. So that unilateral military process has seen some different iterations <laughs> over time. Um, the most recent iteration goes by the name of the detainee review boards. Um, long story short, the, the process that the military uses is entirely deficient um, when you compare it against standards of due process that apply 
within the borders of the United States, standards of due process that were applied by the military extraterritorially before the events of September 11th, and certainly the, the detainee review boards fall short of due process um, under international law. So what's deficient about these, these detainee review boards? I think for one thing, lack of access to counsel is a key deficiency. Um, there's no real opportunity through these hearings to confront the evidence against you. There's no real opportunity to present um, evidence or witnesses in your own defense. There's no opportunity to appeal an unfavorable determination, let alone to appeal an unfavorable determination to an impartial and regularly constituted court. Um, and even when the, the detainee review boards reach a favorable determination, those determinations are seldom, if ever, implemented. They're meaningless. Um, so I think in recognition of all of this, um, the fact that there is pending litigation in the United States, um, which is spearheaded by the International Justice Network, the organization I'm with, along with a number of co-counsel, um, the pendency of this litigation is, is still important because the, the right of access to um, habeas corpus for at least a, 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 a sort of a fraction of the prison population, those petitioners who are non-Afghan citizens in whom the Afghan government has no interest, and those prisoners who were not captured and whom the government does not even assert were captured on the Afghan battlefield, but were forcibly rendered to this war zone for the purpose of indefinite detention. You know, that, that sort of subgroup of prisoners in all key respects is no differently situated than the prisoners of Guantanamo. So they should have an equivalent right to challenge their detention in US courts. But the Obama administration has fought against that tooth and nail. And I think that, um, and continues to do so to this day. And I think that the fact that the Obama administration asserts the authority to be able to forcibly render individuals to Afghanistan for the purpose of indefinite detention. Um, the fact that it asserts the authority to undertake that practice should be of concern to all of us. And it contrasts very strongly to um, this renewed rhetoric we've been hearing about the need to close Guantanamo, the importance of closing Guantanamo. I think what the contrast reveals is that when the president talks about closing Guantanamo, is he really just talking about this one facility? And if that's the case, that's that's not acceptable. What's problematic about Guantanamo is the sim like the, the practice of indefinite detention that it's come to symbolize. It's the practice that's the problem. It's not the actual place where the practice is being um, uh, implemented. So it, it would do none of us or anyone any service for Guantanamo to be relocated to within the borders of the United States. Um, I don't think that the problem gets resolved if the closure of Guantanamo just means the opening of an equivalent prison in another uh, prison location outside of our borders. Um, so I think this is a very uh, this is a very important thing to remain vigilant about. That um, to the extent that the public discourse has focused around Guantanamo, I think that there are understandable reasons for why that's come to be the case, and I'm. I'm not opposed to Guantanamo as a convenient symbol for this problematic practice of indefinite detention. But you know, make no mistake that it's the practice that's the problem. And I think that that needs to be reasserted more in how uh, indefinite detention gets discussed. And to the extent that anybody is interested in um, sort of uh, advocating on behalf of the closure of Guantanamo, the cessation of these practices, just keep, keep keep this in mind, um, that it's not about the place, it's about the practice. Um, but, okay, so I think something else that's worth worth sort of uh, bringing up, and it's sort of maybe how I'll, I'll finish my, my piece. Um, Deborah mentioned that, um, that the prison facilities at Bagram have been transitioned, or have been handed over to the Afghan government. Um, that, in many respects, is simply not true. Um, it, it's a fiction, um, but it's a fiction that both the U.S. and the Afghan governments have been um, have been advancing very strongly, and 
you know, for their own political gain, right? It helps the Afghan government um, to, uh, to sort of advance a perception of its own sovereignty, to say, no, we have all of our prisoners now in our own custody. The U.S. is washing its hands of, of the detention game in Afghanistan. And of course, it serves U.S. interests to be able to say the same. Um, and the president actually uh, made a very brief mention of the fact that um, the facilities in Afghanistan have been transitioned or are transitioning to, to the Afghan government. But we know, for one thing, that the, the uh, population of non-Afghan prisoners is very much still in exclusive and indefinite U.S. custody. We also know that the Afghan government has never once made any claim of having an interest in this group of prisoners. Um, and then also we do know that um, the U.S. Has, is still taking people into its custody, presumably Afghans. Um, we also know that um, that the sort of nominal handover that occurred in March of this year um, occurred pursuant to an agreement between the U.S. and Afghan governments that has not yet been made public. We don't know the terms and conditions. Um, so we don't know, for example, to the extent that the U.S. is um, is holding newly captured Afghans. We don't know whether uh, this agreement allows them to continue to hold on to these people indefinitely or whether there's a deadline by which new captures have to be handed over. Um, we know, for example, that there are uh, some unknown number of Afghans whom the United States has designated as so-called enduring security threats, whom the US on that basis refuses to hand over to the Afghan government for fear that the Afghan government will um, release these individuals. Um, so it's just not true that the United States has closed up shop with respect to, to detention operations in Afghanistan. And the final thing that I'd like to leave folks with is that um, to the extent that some prisoners, or many prisoners, let's say, have been actually physically handed over to the Afghan government, um, it's been on the condition uh, that at least some portion of those men um, are held indefinitely by their Afghan jailers under Afghan law. So this is a very unfortunate legacy of the United States occupation and presence in Afghanistan as we have uh, imported indefinite detention to that country and we have conditioned our exit and our supposed um, cessation of detention operations of our own on the assumption of equivalent detention operations by the Afghan government. Um, and that's incredibly concerning. Um, so I think there's still a question as to whether internally um, within the other sort of uh, branches of Afghan government that will be accepted or embraced. There may be a fight that's had among the branches of Afghan government, the judiciary in particular, about whether such a system would be legal under the constitution and laws of Afghanistan, but um, it, it may well be that this becomes something, this becomes a, fix, a fixture in Afghanistan, and this is a footprint that um, is directly attributable to the U.S. occupation. And it's very unfortunate. Um, so I don't mean to sort of cast a gloomy pal on on the hopeful um, conclusion to Jeremy's piece, but you know, I I'll, I'll, it's just facts, people. Yeah. Just the messenger. Just the messenger. Yeah. We've presented two rather impassioned and very well informed um, glimpses into what we were talking about, and it, it makes me feel all the more correct in kind of identifying indefinite detention as the problem um, that we're up against where, wherever it is. And of course, you know, keeping in mind the background to this is that the National Defense Authorization Act applies indefinite detention um, to US citizens anywhere in the world on the authorization of the president, right? I, I think that yeah. that's a, an accurate statement. It's not anything that's required by the National Defense right. Authorization Act, but the way that Congress sort of uh, drafted the, these provisions um, in the uh, legislation over the past couple of years, uh, it allows for that possibility. It's not anything that the administration has yet taken uh, advantage of. Um, no one since the passage of this legislation has been taken into military custody within the borders of the United States for the purpose of indefinite detention, um, but it could happen. I mean, we don't, we don't want to, I don't think, be at the mercy of executive discretion, and I don't think it's, it's, it's great for our Congress to have um, left 
the room for, for that kind of practice to take place in the hands of a different president. Um, which isn't to say that a different president might not claim the unilateral authority to do so, whatever Congress does or doesn't say, but it never helps when Congress gives its, its approval to an unsavory practice of the president. Just to code it to that, at least as far as we know, nobody has been yeah. detained as far as we know. Um, we just learned two weeks ago when the president spoke at the National Defense University that in fact we had been thinking three U.S. citizens had been killed by drones, but he he said no, really, it's been four. <laughs> we didn't know about the fourth person, and it really does, you know, raise the questions. There's the willful ignorance of the American people of not knowing very much about Bagram or what's going on. But then there's the ignorance that is part of the de facto um, situation now where the government has all the secrecy and privacy has been switched on its head. It was more so the case decades ago that the government was supposed to be transparent and citizens were assumed to have privacy, right? That's all different as we've learned with a, um, a big thump this week when Glenn Greenwald uh, released the secret memos showing that the NSA has been um, actually collecting all of this phone traffic. You know, we're all supposed to feel better because Obama says, well, we weren't actually listening to the conversations. Anyway, it's, I'm just kind of laying out some of the backdrop here. Again, not to push, not to throw lots of cold water on, on the hopeful question, because to me, this, this is the whole point of doing this at the left forum. On the one hand, we actually want to know what's happening. We want the people who really know what's happening to come and tell us the truth, and you know, we'll face up to it. And then we want to think about what it is we can do as conscious activists to counter that. And so I'm interested in hearing from people in the room. You had 400 panels at the Left Forum. Why did you come to this one? And what are, what are you thinking about these questions? You know, you can throw that in as, as you raise your comments or questions. But we'll do a format where you do not have to ask a question. If you want to make a comment, please do or, or ask questions. People are detained or they're being tortured because I mean this is just has just intensified. But you always had it, you know, like in different places in the world. It's not that, like like assassinations. Now we now it's drones, but it, it targeted assassinations are an old thing. And same with the with the places where people are detained illegally. It I don't think there is. You can think back of, of a time where it wasn't so. You know, as soon as you became like a global, you know empire in a way, there, there were places where people were detained. I mean, it was not in such a massive scale, but they were. I mean, well, people were, you know, they, they were supported. And like, for example, in Latin America, where, where I'm from, I mean, all the 60s and 70s and 80s, we had like, people that were detained. And, you know, they were instructed how to torture uh, in the School of the Americas, you know, so. Yeah, but I would say, starting under Bush, it's never been so brazen right. and transparent and defined, like uh, it was often conducted in secret and it was done by proxy and nobody upheld the right to torture as a legal right or a national security imperative. I mean, national security and the kind of means ends morality underwrote those policies, but there was a level of, you know, um, explicit justification in this round that is disturbing and then what's really disturbing is how much all of this has been made legal. I mean, for years we would say Guantanamo is unconstitutional, and you know, properly speaking, very little of this that we object to and insist as a in a normative way is illegal actually is illegal. And then the courts were once our friends, and now it's been mostly loss after loss after loss in the arena of the courts that is sort of immunized, institutionalized immunity, and then made you know, lawful what is nonetheless reprehensible. And I'd rather have a government breaking the law by doing powerful things than a government upholding the law and doing terrible things, and we've moved to the latter. 
know is the extent of popular education that's taken place. People have become aware, for example, about this group of cleared prisoners, right? And the cleared prisoners, I think, become a, a very convenient and useful um, way in which to open people's minds about what good could come from closing Guantanamo, right? I think as soon as you hear the word cleared, you think, well, if there's no need to hold them, why are we holding them? I think the tougher sort of group or conversation that's not had as often is, what about the prisoners who aren't cleared? Who aren't cleared and who are not going to be in charge with any sort of war crime and by military commission? What about them? And so what you hear, I think, um, from our political opponents about the, that group as well, they're too dangerous to release and there's no, uh, there isn't sufficient evidence to try them. And it's sort of left at that. Mm -hmm. But I think it just takes a little bit of scratching, a little bit of digging to um, undermine some of those premises. What does it mean to call somebody too dangerous to release? But that, and then recognize on the other hand that there isn't sufficient evidence to um, uh, accuse them of wrongdoing. It means that whatever information you've been using to justify their confinement was obtained under questionable circumstances. It's not inherently reliable information. So how can you hold someone on the basis of unreliable information and yet claim for real that they're a genuine danger? These things don't add up, and I think that inconsistency is not uh, explored often enough or to a sufficient enough degree in public discourse. And I think that is something that I think most rational people can, can recognize that inconsistency. Um, but it's not an inconsistency that's aired enough, I think, to try and pierce the fear that, that people are irrationally holding on to. Sir. Uh, I want to, uh, I have a question, but I, first I, I, I'd like to say something about uh, relating uh, Guantanamo, uh, Bagram, and Abu Ghraib. If you remember, uh, as I remember back, uh, when Abu Ghraib uh, came to national consciousness, it really uh, shocked people greatly. Uh, especially, I think you have thrown up some of the images there from Abu Ghraib of the uh, blindfolding uh, the prisoners and uh, doing all sorts of um, uh, horrific uh, things to them and torturing them. And. Uh, Th that had a great effect, I think, on uh, in, in the case of um, Abu Ghraib. And in fact, they brought some of the torturers uh, to justice. One of them uh, uh, was from a place near where I um, live. He was from Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Uh, so I think that the situ situation in, um, in Guantanamo and Bagram it's very different from that in the sense that uh, the, the population at large have not been, uh, has not received like the, uh, the revelations about the horrors uh, that uh, go on in both, which I'm sure are very comparable to Abu Ghraib. I, I, I just uh, uh, don't know. But I think that that is one of the questions one of the problems. It is not indifference, as I think somebody suggested. I do not think that the, the people at large are indifferent to this, uh, to this uh, moral uh, cesspool, uh, which uh, the, the government ha has fallen into, and the, uh, and the, and the military. I think th there's a question of um, uh, of information and a lack of information and education of, of, of the people. But my question, I'm sorry for going on a little bit long there, but my question is, has it been investigated about bringing the, 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 these um, detentions in Bagram and in Guantanamo to a higher instance, to the International Criminal Court? and bringing the perpetrators of these crimes, whoever they are, from the president down, to justice at the criminal court. This is, a, I think, a huge problem, obviously, um, but it's nonetheless a fact. But it's not, to say, it's not to say that there isn't any useful way to utilize um, international bodies um, to, bear, to, to bring some pressure to bear on um, responsible U.S. officials.
officials for their misconduct. So one example of this is um, in March of this year, um, I believe that the Center for Constitutional Rights, in conjunction with other attorneys, um, brought petitions on behalf of a number of Guantanamo prisoners before the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights. So the Inter-American Commission um, is not a, a body that has the authority to meet out punishment. It's an advisory body, but still it's a mechanism through which to generate attention about uh, official U.S. misconduct on behalf of the victims of that conduct. Um, and it's, uh, I think, a, a body that was used to good effect for that purpose, given those limitations. And I think that there are other ways in which to use uh, comparable bodies through the United Nations to, um, to sort of regenerate or re-spark um, international um, attention around these ki this kind of misconduct. Um, but unfortunately, where the U.S. is concerned, the International Criminal Court is just not uh, is not on the table. It's not an option. Let me speak to the first comment, if I may. Mm -hmm. I mean, and put a little bit off my professor cap on. I mean, I think the visibility invisibility dynamic is really important. And then the government has, you know, fought to the nail as a deliberate policy to prevent you know, imagery of the horrors that it perpetrates. Like the interrogation tapes from what, the Philippines were destroyed by the CIA. Presumably because they would be so revolting, you know, that if seen, people would sort of rise up in disgust. Nobody can take a picture of a Guantanamo detainee. Congress folk who visit can't interview them. The UN can't interview them. And then there's like a deliberate policy to keep behind the screen of the public gaze like the actual practices, presumably because that revelation, like Abu Ghraib, would be just so disturbing, would throw the practices you know, into question. And that's part of where our name comes in, witness against torture. The idea isn't like you passively look at something and say, tisk tisk. The notion is that there's this sort of revelation of evil, and then that obligates you as a moral agent to then do something about it. So on the one hand, like I think you know, your analysis and instinct is correct, and a lot of in, evidence suggests that it is. But then there's also a sense in which America could know in all of the gory detail and still convince itself that it's okay. I mean, the Senator of the Constitution Project had a you know 2,000 page bipartisan report saying unequivocally America tortured. It wasn't a handful of bad apples. It was at the command of the president and the highest you know officers of the republic. And then it got barely a peep you know, while the Republicans squawked because a handful of, you know, organizations got their tax-exempt status held up by sort of six months. So, like, the assumption that if people were properly informed about something outrageous, they would be outraged, I don't know that that quite holds. And then there's been, in cinema and television, enormous graphic depictions of torture. So even if we don't know the real thing, we know a kind of ersatz, you know, simulation of it. And then it doesn't necessarily provoke the kind of revulsion one would expect. And there have been studies saying that you know up until 2001, most depictions of torture in movies, the torture was considered a bad person. And then now they're considered good people, or it's morally ambiguous whether this was the sort of right or wrong thing. So I think the culture has done a lot to help this process of you know, moral um, you know, rationalization. And I want to believe the spirit of your first point that if people were sufficiently aware, they would be sufficiently outraged. But I don't, I can't say with certainty that that's the case. Well, let, let, let me speak to your first question about torture happens all the time and how could we, you know, what's the, it's a big contextual question. Just speaking as one of the people in this room who was alive and active in the 60s, there was a time in 1974 when the U.S. Senate outlawed political assassination by the CIA. Yes, it was done. Patrice Lumumba was killed cold-bloodedly by the U.S. It happened all over Latin America. You could, you know, we could name dozens of cases, and they got away with it. But when we had a movement in the 60s, some of us were involved at that point, that stopped the Vietnam War that was part of the Black Liberation Movement, Terms got changed in this country. People wouldn't accept that kind of stuff. What happened in Vietnam was no longer acceptable. 
and laws got actually changed so that the CIA couldn't assassinate anymore. If you look at uh, Jeremy Scahill's new book, Dirty Wars, he starts out with that example of the ban on assassinations. And then it's very, very interesting because he works through every administration since. What did Jimmy Carter do? He actually extended the ban a little further against political assassinations. But after that, Reagan, Bush, Daddy Bush, Clinton, they all found ways to get around it. They found it an inconvenience. And then, you know, 9-11 was the excuse to do away with, every, with all of this and to say, essentially, we can have a war, borderless war, without end, and due process is what we say it is. That was the basic content of the speech that Obama gave a couple weeks ago, the national security speech. Due process is what we say it is. It doesn't have to be judicial process. We say we're abiding by the law, so therefore it's legal. And it is very frigging alarming, you know, that, that, that this passes without huge numbers of people in this country saying, what the hell do you mean? You know, this, this is in contradiction to your own law, except that you're rapidly rewriting the laws. So we should have a huge moral outcry. Uh, I, I didn't call on you in the back. Just give me a sense of who else wants to speak. Just, okay, a couple more people. Go ahead. Um, you know, Deborah, you asked what brought us here, what, yeah. why to this particular session. And um, my answer for me personally is that um, I think at the core of this, at, of the torture issue is, um, is the thumbing the nose at the rule of law and all the very most fundamental, foundational tenets of what a democracy is, which is innocent until proven guilty, which is not corny at all, which is innocent until proven guilty, um, you must be charged with something and you have the right to an attorney. All of these most basic um, in, elements of democracy uh, with with during the following 9-11 um, that was Bush Cheney's permission slip to do whatever they wanted boldly and and I personally don't believe that it has anything to do then or now with a genuine concern about national security, about keeping us safe. <coughs> that is bullshit. I'm sorry, they don't give a flying fig. It's, that's not what this is about, okay? And you know what? Coincidentally enough, the notebook I grabbed to bring today is five years old. I hadn't written it because I needed some pages. And I, five years ago, July of 2008, a young woman who's a lawyer, an American, of, but she's Af Afghani descent, had a book, her, her book was published called My Guantanamo Diaries, if you can find it. I regret to tell you, in all my notes I took, and I spoke with her and I bought the book, I don't have her name in my notes, but in five years ago, she speaks Pashta, and it's, her story is unbelievable. This is five years ago, July 2008, she published her book because she spoke this obscure language, okay, um, and is, was a young attorney. Um, or law student at the time, she was, in 2006, allowed into Guantanamo to act, work as a, an interpreter. And her book was censored by the American, the book, many parts of it, they forbade her to publish. And I asked her, I spoke to her afterwards, and I said, did you ever get that back? That's her, you know, what she wrote. There are things that she wrote that never, that they took from her and she never got back. And just as far as, okay, as far as who, she, be, she befriended men who were there in 2006, 2007, okay, and kept notes to write her book. Okay, prisoner number one was shackled to the floor. May peace be upon you, was her greeting to him. His name was Dr. Ali Shami. He, he was a pediatrician. Okay, this is someone who was 
put in Guantanamo as an enemy to, who could hurt us. He was a pediatrician, a Shiite Muslim, persecuted by the Taliban. His wife was an economist, and he had, had at one time in his life worked for the UN. Prisoner number two, Aji Nasrath, I, he, anyway. He was an 80-year-old paraplegic. He had cataracts, he was hard of hearing, he was brought to Guantanamo, accused of being an on-the-ground enemy combatant, okay? His immobile legs, she was this woman, this young woman, this isn't hearsay. I think this is the idea, yeah. Okay, well, I mean, anyway, it's just horrible stuff, and, and what, can, what disturbs me is that we, it's, democracy is just a memory. We don't have it. And when you, Jeremy, said, what's the big picture here? What is the big picture? It has nothing to do, in my opinion, with safety, with keeping us safe, you know, from Al Qaeda. And I read I, letters to the editor of the Daily News because I like to see what the people are saying. And they, there are people who, with all due respect to the gentleman up there, say, well, they torture us. And who, it's the propaganda, it's a process. I think someone used the word process. This process has inured people to have, have has inured so many Americans to the horror of what's going on and TV shows like 24 and so on and and um, and they say well they torture Americans and they hate us for our freedoms the same old propaganda bullshit lines hey guess what there are a lot of people out there who actually believe it so no they're not outraged or upset and there are many groups against torture and working against them, but I want to be optimistic, but I, I Okay, I, we hear you. It's, on the, it's yeah. on the floor. Yeah. It's on the floor. Reality, what's actually happening? A few more questions um, to Gomez and, and Jeremy about what, it, what is happening in Guantanamo. It might be important to say the hunger strike is still continuing. All the reports that we get since Obama spoke is that the prisoners don't feel that his statement that he wants to close the prison someday and that he's not going to embargo you many prisoners any further have led to, to any specific changes. Nobody has been released. You know, now now we're at, at um, two weeks and two days since that happened. So that's a very stark reality we're grappling with. And part of what we wanted to talk about today is, yes, the, there are some things that are, that are in place. There's a coalition across the country working on the question of closing down Guantanamo. I will say, and I really appreciate Hol Naz's point, World Can't Wait, um, hopefully people saw this um, ad that um, Medea signed and many of you donated to that was a full page ad in the Times. We, we wrote this very carefully to, to make three demands. Close Guantanamo now, release the cleared prisoners, and end indefinite detention. Because of these 50 prisoners, you know, that the reason they're not trying them is not because they're too dangerous to try. They tortured them. They can't have a trial. That's why they're not being tried and never going to be released. And that story, you know, do you understand, you guys, that this is one of the few times the pictures of the prisoners in Guantanamo got in the New York Times and we had to pay $52,000? And the only reason we had the pictures was Bradley Manning leaked this via WikiLeaks and we got some of these photos that way. And even then, the Times was telling me we couldn't publish them. You know, just the, the layers of this is really incredible. But I said all that to say there are things that are happening. And on June 26, we're going to be in front of the White House. Um, several people in the, the room are working on that. That's a Wednesday. June is torture month, or rather, anti torture month. Um, <laughs> June is the month that we focus on it, and, and this will be almost four months of the hunger strike by that time. And I, do you want to I talk mean, just, about the plan, you and Medea? I mean, the, the plan is sort of in formation. It probably will include like nonviolent um, direct action and then some kind of ritual cultural component. 
everybody's invited to come. There might be a satellite action in New York City. There's going to be demonstrations in Chicago and other cities. And then a new website has been launched or will launch soon called closedgitmo.net. And then it's important because it's not the creature of any one organization. It's a true coalition collaborative effort that struggles bigger than any one of us. And then we want it to be a kind of one-stop shopping resource that people go to to find out what's happening nationally, internationally, locally. There'll be good news about, or good information about Guantanamo itself. And then right now there are three folks in the United States on a hunger strike and then seven on what are called long-term fasts who are refusing to various degrees to you know, intake food until there's a just resolution to the hunger strike at Guantanamo. And this is an extraordinary sacrifice, obviously. I mean, people Where risking are they? Uh, variety of places, one is in Washington, one in Schenectady, one in Oregon, one in California, like they're all over the place. And then one thing this website does is has a page or two devoted explicitly to telling their stories, having their picture statements from them, uh, you know, help media sort of tell that um, story. So again, you know, there's been really unprecedented public outcry, um, you know, around this. And new pop people are popping up every day, and the idea is to corral and leverage all this incredibly powerful energy into meaningful policy change. It was revealed yesterday that Feinstein, McCain, and the chief of staff of the White House actually went to Guantanamo. They issued a one-sentence thing saying they, they think it's bad for the United States security to maintain Guantanamo. Congress will work with the administration. Boom, done. And the meaning of that, who exactly knows? They conveniently arrived just after the lawyers left, and they didn't bring any press with them. You could read it as a positive sign. It's pathetic as a great, great nation that like, this is the statement from the leading lawmakers in the land, this sort of non-committal piece of nothingness in response to <laughs> this urgent hunger strike. But reading the tea leaves, maybe this is an indication that like something is afoot, but you know, we're the last to know. So that's closedgitmo.net. G-I-T-M-O.net. And um, there's information there about the mass incarceration in the U.S. It, you know, it, it's, it's a good effort. I, we would like people to to come down and wear orange jumpsuits in front of the White House in larger numbers than we've ever had. We really should be able to encircle the White House. It's a Wednesday. People can take off work, come down for the day. There's a lot of people in the D.C. area. We have two weeks to plan this and make this real. There's also going to be at 7.30 tomorrow evening a vigil for the hunger strikers just as the left forum ends. There's going to be singing that's put together by Witness Against Torture. And I would really, you know, I want to push this again because this message I, th I think is real important. We're printing it in the Progressive Magazine. We really want to publish this internationally because remember, one of the things that Obama said, well, when he wasn't being interrupted by Miss Benjamin <laughs> was, hey, look, this is extraordinary. This is the head of the biggest empire in the history of the world. And he's saying the problem is other countries are not going to want to give us prisoners if they're going to end up in Guantanamo. That's extraordinary that he's admitting that, right? So we would like to publish this message internationally. We would like people to know in the rest of the world that there are people in this country who are want an end to Guantanamo and indefinite detention. And in terms of the relationship between Bagram and Guantanamo, you guys are the almost the only ones working on Bagram. Um, well, uh, in the United Very States, few yeah, in, in the, the U.S. In the United States, um, our organization is spearheading the pending litigation here. Um, there's a British organization um, that is active with respect to Bagram detention and it has a sort of sister organization in Pakistan advocating on behalf of the Pakistani detainees. Um, but altogether, it's a really small, small group of attorneys. Um, some of the larger um, human rights organizations, they include Bagram as part of their policy platform, uh, but the, the individuals um, out there who are advocating directly on behalf of the men who are imprisoned, that group is very small. Um, but, you know, we, we're doing what we can. We'll see what'll happen. I mean, I know that we've got um, a litigation deadline coming up here in the United States. Um, it's coming up 
uh, towards the end of June. So to the extent that um, some press might get generated around that, that would be a way of sort of re-sparking public awareness about what's going on. Um, I think whenever oral arguments get scheduled in these cases, so there are three pending cases in the United States, they're going to be put before the same panel in the Court of Appeals for oral arguments on the same day. That date hasn't yeah. been determined yet, um, but when that all gets uh, pinned down, I think that'll be a very yes. useful day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah. for support. But you know, just in terms of linking, if we were, if we are able to back down the U.S. government around Guantanamo and get somewhere on indefinite detention, then then you have those six thousand prisoners in Bagram, and you have rendition continuing, and God knows what else, and and, and it isn't over. But they should get a defeat on this. We have to create a political situation where Obama no longer can keep this open. That's what I feel. I'm going to add one yeah. quick thing, but it's like kind of a can of worms, but it's interesting to think about. To the extent that um, that in public discourse, there's a little bit of a, um, a contrast that's made between, well, you know, if you don't want, if we're not going to use drones, we need indefinite detention. Sometimes yeah. these things get, get married yeah. together and talked about uh, together in sort of problematic ways. And I think that's important um, to try and push back on too, that we don't need either. <laughs> we don't need to be killing right. people extrajudicially and we don't need to be indefinitely detaining um, people for their so-called intelligence value. Right. In, in fact, there was, we put a comment uh, in our ad from someone in the Bush administration who said that he thought the reason that, um, that Obama wanted to use drone targeted assassination and drone killings was to avoid taking prisoners, to avoid the issue of indefinite detention. Yeah. So you said that's not the way you wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming.